to our weekly uh, seminar for uh, this year's first year grad students. I started a discussion group on uh, e-courses. So feel free to post the thing. Let's give this a try. I have no idea if this is going to work out because I've never used e-courses in that sense. But in principle, it should be able to do it. So keep in mind, you know, uh, if there's anything interesting on any talk, particularly this talk, uh, take notes and we can discuss it through our discussion section since this is technically part of the class. Um, but for today's uh, um, seminar, I'm happy to uh, introduce Sophie McCallum, who is a, a Chief of Staff at Deep Isolation, uh, and John Grimsage, who uh, is a, a Berkeley graduate uh, also, and is the Assistant of the Chief Technological Office uh, for, uh, for Deep Isolation. Now you all heard probably something about Deep Isolation by now, so they have a new approach in disposing of nuclear waste. Uh, they're right here in Berkeley. And you're now out there since two years? Three years? A year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Company, okay. company, company three, years. three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah, that's what I thought. three years. And uh, makes great progress in trying to dispose nuclear waste in deep boreholes with, with a new approach. So they're interested to learn more how, how, how this goes and uh, how to create the market for nuclear waste disposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming today. Uh, it's an honor to be presenting our company and our innovative approach to dispose of nuclear waste. So um, I'm Sophie McCallum. I'm Chief of Staff at Deep Isolation. I've been in the company for a year and a half. My background is in business operations. Uh, I have an MBA from a business school in France. Uh, and I came to the Silicon Valley 10 years ago and immersed myself uh, into the startup world. Uh, my expertise lies in growing and scaling small companies pre-revenue uh, and leading the expansions. Uh, with me is John Grimsich, assistant to CTO at Deep Isolation. Yeah, hi, I'm John Grimsich. Uh, I have a master's in geology from UC Berkeley. I've been working with Deep Isolation now for just eight months. Um, I work closely with our uh, CTO and uh, have been looking at uh, geologic background and uh, isotopic systems that they apply to repository systems. And so in a nutshell, Deep Isolation is a startup company based right here in Berkeley. Um, it has been three years that we've been um, incorporated. And we developed a new solution for nuclear waste storage or disposal. Um, today we will present uh, who we are and introduce our technology. But we will also give a business perspective um, of how we think a private company should tackle this global issue and what are the steps uh, we need to take to successfully implement our solution in a highly regulated and uh, slow moving environment. So why are we here today? Uh, close to 500 nuclear power plants have been created uh, since the first one uh, in 1954 and nuclear represents over 10% of the world's total energy uh, with countries without nuclear power currently developing plans to deploy commercial nuclear reactors. So I'm sure you know a lot about the history and I'm not going to go into detail but um, no matter if somebody is pro or against nuclear there is uh, waste that needs to be dealt with. Um, and that has accumulated to date. Uh, so the world's growing inventory of nuclear waste is around 450,000 tons um, and increasing by 12,000 tons annually. Um, and however, there's no country, including the United States, that has a permanent geologic repository for disposal of commercial spent nuclear fuel or other high-level waste. Uh, Finland plans to be the first one to establish the, the world's first underground nuclear waste disposal and that um, operations are uh, supposed to begin in 2023. So this is obviously an environmental risk, but also a financial one. Um, as of September 2018, the nuclear waste fund balance is 39 billion, uh, and the government estimates uh, total li liabilities to be over 35 billion, of which they have paid 7.4 billion uh, to utilities to offset the responsibility to store the waste. So definitely a big issue. Our founders, Elizabeth um, Marner, environmentalist, and scientist Richard Marner, who also start, started Berkeley Earth, which is a non-profit that monitors and analyzes the Earth's surface temperature records and pollution rates to help fight climate change, um, starting thinking about nuclear waste management. And they came up um, with the idea of using directional drilling technologies, which have been perfected in the last two decades uh, by the oil and gas industry, and apply it to nuclear waste management to dispose nuclear waste in horizontal controls. Um, they came to the realization that if anything um, 
was to be done in a, and in a timely manner and would have to be through private innovation, um, which can bring solutions much quicker than sometimes big governments can. Uh, we've seen this in other industries uh, where progress, speed and cost savings uh, were gained by private companies entering the market. So one of the most recent ones that everybody knows is Elon Musk, who completely revolutionized the space industry. Um, Elon Musk created SpaceX with a true ambitious goal to make space flight routine and affordable and make humans a multi-planet species. Um, so Elon Musk talks a lot about um, his rocket design, which stands for one core principle, which is simplicity, which enables both reliability and low cost. So there's actually a lot of parallel with our industry. Um, Musk felt that the space industry had not evolved in the last 50 years. Um, he thought that aerospace companies had little competition and tended to make expensive products, which is what we see in the nuclear waste uh, management industry. And, and he felt that he could really um, capitalize on huge advances in computing power and materials that had taken place over the last couple of decades, which is something that we hope to do um, using directional drone technologies. Another industry I like to think of is the biotech, which is a very fast-growing, uh, lucrative industry, uh, with a market size valued at over 300 billion in 2015. Um, the biotech market is expected to double size to 775 billion by 2024, um, and private investment in the medical field has allowed to significantly increase the pace of innovation. So today, biopharmaceutical bio companies have bought more than 500 new medicines in the US in the last 15 years, and 91% of that are developed by the private sector with no direct government. So a little bit back to us. Um, so our founders started developing a simple solution uh, that is support, supported by international research. It is agreed in the scientific community that deep geologic repositories are probably the best solution for safe disposal of nuclear waste. And advances in the drilling industries meant that we can now drill very deep holes that are large enough to hold nuclear waste. The horizontal drilling technology that will be used is highly developed uh, and can be implemented at a relatively low cost. It can be modular, um, thus minimizing transportation concerns by allowing disposal at or near the generation site. And cost and safety are also improved by the fact that um, no person needs to go out to during construction. So we first looked at the market and see if there was a real opportunity. Uh, there was. It is a market that represents 500 billion US dollars, uh, with the USA being number one at 21% of the market. So this represented a real we create an opportunity for potential investors willing to take a risk with us. And yet there's no operational repository, so no competition. So we had the, the idea, the market opportunity, and the right time. So we decided, okay, let's look into this and see if we have a sound concept. Um, I'm going to show a very short video that explains, a couple minutes video that explains our technology at a high level before we jump into the details. But the solution is unique because nobody had thought of horizontal drills for nuclear waste. So this is kind of the idea. So let's see if this works. Consensus is that the best way to dispose of nuclear waste from power generation and other applications is to put it into deep geological isolation. Deep Isolation is the first company to develop a complete process for disposing of waste using deep horizontal drill holes. This video introduced. <laughs> <laughs> and other applications is to put it into deep geological isolation. Deep Isolation is the first company to develop a complete process for disposing of waste using deep horizontal drill holes. This video introduces our process. Nuclear waste, specifically spent fuel, from commercial nuclear reactors is made of small ceramic pellets of a compound called uranium dioxide. These pellets are held in long tubes called fuel rods and the rods are arranged into bundles called fuel assemblies. The shape and size of a fuel assembly depends on the type of reactor it comes from. In a pressurized water reactor, fuel assemblies measure 12 inches diagonally and typically 13 feet long. 
Each fuel assembly can hold more than 250 fuel rods and 100,000 pellets. As of today, no spent nuclear fuel has been disposed of in the world. Spent fuel is still above ground in pools or in storage casks. In deep isolations process, we place fuel assemblies containing spent fuel into special canisters that fit into deep drill holes and are designed to prevent the escape of radioactive materials. Each canister is made of a highly corrosion-resistant nickel-chromium molybdenum alloy that will remain a barrier for containment of radionuclides for tens of thousands of years. Burying the spent fuel assemblies deep in the ground provides permanent protection from the long-lived radioisotopes that can be harmful for up to a million years. To ensure protection, we bury the spent fuel in rock far below the water table and where liquids have been out of contact with the surface for hundreds of thousands to millions of years. We start by drilling a larger diameter hole. For this video, we assume it is 36 inches in diameter and several hundred feet deep. A steel pipe, called a surface casing, is inserted into the hole. Cement is pushed down the casing and up the space between the rock and the casing, providing an additional seal. The cemented steel surface casing provides isolation from aquifers during the fuel emplacement process. We then drill down several thousand feet and gently change direction of the drill hole until it is horizontal. At this depth, the diameter is only 18 inches, just enough to hold the casing and spent fuel canisters. We will only dispose of spent fuel in deep layers of rock that are extremely well isolated from the surface and where isolation can be verified using established and proven geologic methods. Now let's go back to the surface and look at how we put the spent fuel canisters into the deep drill hole repository using standard oil and gas equipment, such as a wire line and tractor assembly, oil tubing, or oil pipe conveyance. For this example, we have pictured a wire line and tractor assembly. The entire process above ground is done in a way that provides a safe environment for personnel and the public. The first canister is slowly lowered down the drill hole. Deep underground, the drill hole gently turns 8 degrees every 100 feet to the horizontal section. The spent fuel canister easily travels around this gentle curve without any distortion, a technique successfully developed over the last 20 years. Wheels on the tractor assembly help the canister move along the horizontal section of the drill hole. The first canister is in place. The tractor assembly is released from the canister and withdrawn. This process is repeated until all the spent fuel is in place in the horizontal section of the drill hole. The vertical part of the drill hole is sealed with rock and other materials. Within a few years, the enormous weight of the rock above compresses these materials and provides an excellent seal to the narrow access hole. Deep Isolation is the only company in the world with a demonstrated and patented solution for the deep geological isolation of nuclear waste using horizontal drill holes. A solution that is fast, cost-effective, risk-averse, and available now. The global... So we had an idea and now we needed to execute. So, um... Going to be more of a business perspective here. But first, we started with building uh, an incredible board of advisors um, to help us elaborate a sound, viable solution. Uh, our board of advisors include former Secretary of Energy Stephen Shu, uh, Physics Nobel Prize winner Abel Penzias, and nuclear engineering experts such as Bob Budnitz, Pat Peterson, as well as environmentalists and incredibly successful entrepreneurs and investors. So, why makes to help us um, work on the idea and the concept. Then we needed to do our technical due diligence uh, as, well as, work as, uh, as well as work on some key aspects to the business that would drive our success, so stakeholder engagement, regulatory and business development. So in other words, we needed a team, we needed investors. So we raised the first angel round uh, in May 2018 at 600k. This enabled us to um, further, further develop the concept hire our first government affairs staff to better understand how to navigate the U.S. regulatory environment, and start stakeholder engagement efforts. Uh, so we did this from the very beginning, uh, before we even had a website, because we believe that this is really where most other disposal uh, efforts have failed. In the process of introducing our new approach for disposing of nuclear waste, we consistently encourage conversations and inclusiveness, 
And we believe that the only way we can provide a viable and enduring solution is through building relationships and engaging in public discussions early on uh, before the design of the solution is completed. In parallel, we started uh, talking to experts in their respective fields uh, that could potentially join our team. So we needed a mix of expertise from waste management to stakeholder engagement, government affairs, as well as business functions such as marketing, uh, business ops, strategy, finance, and so on. Um, we didn't have the funds to pay them, uh, but they agreed to join us because they were sold on our vision and our mission. Um, we then conducted a seed round in 2018, and we were finally in a position to hire the team we had put together, and that's where we are today. Uh, so our company is composed of two worlds, really meeting each other, so the nuclear industry world and the Silicon Valley world. And this cultural mesh is really what enabled us to, uh, to be where we are today and where we believe we will be able to be successful. So a little word about our investors, we have 14 million uh, raised to date, um, and this is not easy in this industry. Um, it's very risky for investors to invest in something that's never been done before in a um, highly regulated and slow moving industry. But we have between 30 and 40 investor, investors today, environmentalists, venture capitalists, investing their personal funds, successful entrepreneurs, as well as concerned citizens. So. Um, Everybody is sharing the same vision as the company, which is to solve an important uh, environmental problem. And they demonstrated confidence in both the technology and the leadership team. So that was very important. They were sold on the team, the advisory team and the staff, and wanted to be attached to something that could really make a difference. So we had the idea, the team and the money, and we developed our technology. So I will let John go into the details on our concept. Thanks, Sophie. Great. So I'm going to give you a, a little further introduction to our core technical team. Um, Rich Muller is an emeritus professor of physics at UC Berkeley. He's the founder and, and really uh, chief innovator in the group. Uh, Stefan Fistoli is our groundwater hydrologist and he handles modeling efforts. He's a former Lawrence Berkeley National Lab scientist, now an independent consultant, is one of, one of the principal developers of the Tough Modeling Code Suite that is used in many research facilities and URLs around the world. Jamie Rector is a borehole geophysicist and he holds joint appointments in the Earth and Planetary Sciences and Civil and Engineering uh, at UC Berkeley. He has decades of experience in the oil exploration field. John Apps is our geochemist and isotope geochemist. He's the former head of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab's Earth Sciences Division. John has been working with the geochemical evolution of the repository horizons, as well as evaluating effects of radiolysis, casing and canister corrosion, as well as radionuclide migration. Joe Payer uh, is our corrosion specialist. He's been he's on technical leave at the moment. But uh, he, along with John Apps, are primarily responsible for our early canisters of work and corrosion modeling. I'm John Grimm, since I've already been introduced, but I, I, my master's work at UC Berkeley was not related to nuclear waste disposal, um, but I'm learning fast and, uh, and, and trying to take it all in. So I'm just presenting just, I'm going to present just a little piece of our technical effort <coughs> because it's so broad and I've got about 10 minutes to do it in, and I think it's better to kind of dive deep into one area a little bit. So um, that's what I'm going to do, and since my focus has been on uh, primarily geology and isotopic systems, that's going to be where I head. But I sort of wanted to, before I started, sort of make two points. I want to reiterate, even though this is a technical talk, that about three quarters of our efforts tend to focus around political and stakeholder engagement efforts. It's really not a, it, I mean, it is a technological issue. There are technological challenges. Um, but if you were a fly on the wall in our weekly meetings, you would think that most of the energy is around really building a consensus in the community. So that's really critical. The other thing I want to do is make sure that when we show these graphics that, that you really get a sense of the scale of, of, of these deep boreholes and the relationship to the geology. If you change the scale so that two kilometers was compressed into two meters and our repository went down the two kilometers and then over two meters and then over one meter, the size of an 18 inch borehole would be roughly the thickness of a human hair. So it's, it's really a minimal disturbance to the environment, and I think that's really a key feature. So 
Uh, that said, uh, I also, I guess I should mention that we have three peer-reviewed technical papers that we put together, this group has put together in the past, uh, really the past year, um, and all told, de there's decades of experience in drilling technology, and, and uh, this group has really been involved in um, nuclear waste disposal, particularly John Apps and Joe Payer, Joe Payer and Stefan Finsterly for, for many, many years, there's probably over 100 years of experience, and and probably frustration, ultimately, <laughs> at this point. Everybody's ready to, to figure out a way to kind of solve this problem. So I'll just, I'll just kind of run through some of the deep isolation repository benefits as I see them. Um, basically, I mean, all things being equal, there's just a fundamental safety in depth. It's going to take longer for uh, radionuclides to, to be transported to the surface. And, our repositories are very far below aquifer, it's much further than mine repositories, so we think there's an extra safety feature there. Um, we also have an increased volume of rock that we're allowed to explore. So if you look here, you kind of imagine it, it's, you're, we have the ability to tap three to four times the depth and volume of rock. And can be more selective about what type of geology is suitable and have more opportunity at any given site to precisely place uh, a repository in a host environment. Um, another benefit is that in these deep environments, generally they're reducing, which is uh, beneficial for both radionuclide mobility and also corrosion. Um, as I said before, we're building on established technologies, drilling technologies, both directional drilling and the placement and retrieval um, uh, of you know, any number of, you know, the, the drilling industry handles these kind of problems on a daily basis. Um, Again, I want to emphasize that we have a far smaller excavation size versus a mine repository. There are, of course, no workers in the environment, as Sophie said. Um, a relatively small footprint and the potential for reactor site co-location. So ultimately, we, th we think that it's the combined safety and cost effectiveness of the solution that is going to drive it. So, in spite of the consensus that geologic disposal of high-level waste is the best option, we have to still answer the fundamental questions, and we still have to prove the case. So are geologic repositories safe? How can we demonstrate this? And can we apply simple tests that confirm the safety of the repository and a particular disposal method? Uh, this, I, this applies broadly to both mine and borehole type repositories, and the same sorts of tests and methods should be of relevance to each. So, there's a complexity here that comes not just from the uniqueness of every particular site, but also from the fundamental differences in host rock types. And I don't know how familiar all of you are with geology, but these are all very different um, rock formations. They will have very different mechanical and hydrologic properties. And, and the, types, the types of efforts that can be made in one of these um, rock sequences uh, or the types of, of modeling and experimental work required for one of these types of rocks is not necessarily going to cross over to others. So and we, we also have to sort of understand that there are limits to what we can know. Uh, there are limits to, you know, how well we're going to be able to characterize, ultimately characterize uh, and, and project millions of the, up to a million years in the future. And there's always going to be some level of uncertainty. So what are the strategies that we can employ to build a robust geologic safety case? The way I see it, there are two distinct and complementary approaches to evaluate the geology of a repository. On the one hand, there are modeling and computational analytic approaches. And here, fundamental rock properties are modeled and investigated, including the porosity, hydraulic conductivity, absorptive capacity, heat capacity, etc. These data are then integrated with results from relatively short-term experiments done generally at URLs. And these models then extrapolate the repository behavior over million year time frames based on these mixture of first principles uh, efforts and, and, and small short term, you know, maybe perhaps decadal frame experimental efforts. Um, these, these modeling efforts offer a great amount of insight and flexibility in exploring potential scenarios. And insights from, from these efforts are often broadly applicable 
to other similar post rock strata. So for instance, work that's being done in Switzerland on clay deposits is also going to be applicable to perhaps France or Belgium. Uh, similarly, uh, work on granitic uh, basement rock done in Switzerland, Finland, and other places that are going to be applied, applicable generally to, to Canada or similar rock forms. So what I'd like to focus on though is, is sort of a second approach. And I think, you know, at deep isolation, Stefan Fitzgerald is, mon is, is managing our modeling and computational analysis. But Rich has sort of really thought it was an important focus to try and find some key measurements that we can make that can verify that a given rock, you know, a given repository strata has actually been isolated for million years and look at that past performance. So this second approach involves the direct, evi direct evidence of measured, excuse me, the second approach involves seeking direct measured evidence that the repository has been isolated from surface waters and has demonstrated the retention of mobile elements for geologic time frames. These tests are always site-specific and involve the direct measurement. The successful demonstration of past isolation and performance of the repository strata, though no guarantee of future behavior, is certainly an important element in developing the safety case and complements uh, modeling inference. At DI, we're pursuing both of these efforts. So here I'm just going to present a slide that has a whole slew of complicated uh, groundwater isotopic systems. Um, this field is, is really highly developed, and I won't be able to go into it in great detail, but I think it's important. Just I'll, I'll read through, but I want to kind of let you see here that there are different types, there are different isotopic systems operating over different time frames. So we're looking particularly at Krypton 81 as an indicator of surface water infiltration. Chlorine 36 is broadly applicable to, to uh, deep rock strata because it can give you a sense that the poor water brines in the rock strata have been isolated for about a million and a half years. The limitations on those two isotopes are based principally upon their uh, radioactive half lives, which are about, for Krypton 81, 229,000 years, and for chlorine 36, uh, 301,000 years. So you really, they really have relevance for about five half lives for between 1.2 and 1.5 million years. Um, still, that's, those are very good indications for the, the, the durability or the percent uh, of a the very relevant for repository replacement. Um, in the deep subsurface, helium, argon, and krypton, the noble gases uh, tend to be particularly valuable because they're created by the decay of uranium in the deep subsurface. Um, uranium decays with alpha decay and produces uh, these alpha particles uh, impact uh, on other elements in the subsurface and they release neutrons. Uh, alpha particle helium Helium and alpha particles are one and the same. And so what you model in the subsurface is the accumulation of helium and then the differential accumulation of different isotopes, of various isotopes of argon, neon, krypton, and xenon. And that tends to, that proves to be a very powerful method to work with. And so the idea here is that we're taking direct measurements of a number of different depths and applying information from a number of isotopic systems to really provide a picture of the subsurface that, that goes beyond just the internal rock properties that are being modeled in, in, a, in a traditional computational approach. So it's the, con it's the combination of, of getting this direct evidence that, that maybe this system has been isolated for a long time and that with minimal disturbance, it's, it's uh, you know, we have an insured, uh, we've got a higher assurance that we've got a good safety case. So lastly, I just want to give an example. And, and this is really important to me because <coughs> that as a geologist, I've been very skeptical um, of crystal basement repositories. Uh, and yet some countries only have crystal basement available as for geologic repositories. Um, these include Canada, Finland, and uh, Sweden. <coughs> and there are currently mine repositories being constructed in Sweden and Finland. And part of, my, part of my concern with these repositories is they tend to, uh, water tends to travel in these granitic basement rocks along fracture lines. And these fractures have been demonstrated to be connected from the surface to great depth. Uh, if you measure the, the, the water pressure at two to three kilometers, you're only gonna have hydrostatic heads. 
And this has been a pretty significant argument um, against the safety of, of crystal abatement repositories and one of the reasons why these mine repositories are, are so oversized and packed with large mass of uh, buffers like benzonites. Um, so I've been, I was actually very skeptical of deep isolation's approach um, for these repositories because we have such a small footprint and we, have such a, we don't have much buffering capacity, right? So um, not that long ago, I started seeing publications, uh, I became aware of publications where uh, people working in, in, in Canada, uh, scientists working in Canada, um, we're looking at the deep pore waters and, and mines. And these mines are about 250 kilometers apart. And they found that once they got down below about a kilometer and a half, despite the fact that there's a hydrostatic pressure head, the brines have been accumulating noble gases in isolation for tremendously long time frames, um, you know, from 200 to 600 million years at the Sudbury site, and 1.1 to 1.7 billion years at 2.4 kilometers of depth. Um, at the Cape Creek mine. Similar studies have now been done in Finland, and they've seen similar results. That when you get to very, when you get below a certain depth in crystalline basement rock, there is some sort of uh, independent, very slow-moving convection that maintains isolation from the surface environment. And of course, that's extremely relevant for the safe disposal of this waste. And you can just imagine. I would go back to the analogy of human hair you have such a minimal disturbance and such a large system that's been operating in isolation, that's, that's been so durable for so long, that to me this, this goes a long way toward making uh, uh, a safety case in, in this environment. And just to give you a sense of scale uh, of how durable and persistent this isolation is. So this region was covered with ice about 10 times in the past million years, up to maybe a, a mile of ice is covered this. And so these ice sheets have, have advanced and retreated, and there have been all kinds of isostatic loading that's been that, that they've been going through. And that has not appeared to affect the isolation of these deep brines. A little further back, you get to the KT impact 65 million years ago, these brines were still there. You go back a little further, we have a supercontinent Pangea. And so this, this these are very old rocks. These rocks are about two billion years old. But they, and it looks as if they have, they have maintained, they have stayed isolated for a significant fraction of that time over a really, really long uh, geologic time frame. And so these numbers sort of pale in comparison to the sorts of numbers that we're trying to, that we think about typically with nuclear waste, which already seem very long, these, these sort of dwarf it. So I'm just going to end with that and uh, give it back to Sophie. What are the numbers for Finland and Sweden? Like oh, 30 million years old. Yeah, it's long. Pretty long. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> okay, so, so we developed that technology, which was mature, and it was um, important to start uh, turning towards cells and validate our business model. So we kicked off our sales effort uh, with a public demonstration in January of this year, which we held in Cameron, Texas. And around 40 representatives from multiple countries came. We invited investors, potential customers, environmentalists, and local citizens. I'll play you a, bit, a very short video of what that looked like, uh, but that's really when we started being open for business. Uh, we started building strategic and commercial partnerships, uh, which led to a vector partnership in June of this year. Uh, we decided to turn to international markets, uh, as we knew that uh, we couldn't dispose of commercial spent fuel in the US in a very short uh, future. And we diversified our offer to include defense waste and internal storage in the US. So I'm going to play a quick video of what our demonstration looked like. Um, so what we did, we emplaced the prototype canister, um, which was created from our design, uh, and in the blow hole, and then retrieved it later that day. You are about to witness a significant milestone for the nuclear waste industry. A crew of oil and gas drillers is setting up for a demonstration that will showcase how it is possible to safely store nuclear waste.
say thank you everyone for being here with us today. We're really excited that we've come so far in the past year, that we've had um, support largely from individuals in order to take us here. Um, so we, we've really done the impossible when it comes to uh, getting a toehold in an industry um, that many people thought could, could never change. Well, no glory on the Monon County. I wish it was a little better weather, but get what we take. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this facility here in our county. We appreciate deep isolation. Welcome to them anytime. Just before this first part of the demonstration was completed, the attendees were given a tour of the rig in action. Our canister at the moment is still attached to that wire, but is about half a mile deep now and probably somewhat along the horizontal section as well. So we haven't yet gotten the signal that it's been released, um, but we're, we're, we're getting it. What we do is we activate the hanger with a tool called the Resolve tool. That sets the hanger. And then we unscrew from the hanger and we retract the tractor. Everyone watched as the wire cable was retracted. Oh, so, there it is. Um, and the 
Another big challenge, obviously, it's a highly regulated environment uh, where the licensing process will be costly, lengthy, uh, and difficult. Uh, yet, at the same time, we need to demonstrate revenue potential now uh, to attract investors. So, a couple of things you can take away uh, when you're developing your own game-changing solutions. Um, we developed a safe, uh, simple, elegant solution that is more cost-effective um, than a traditional mine repository that minimizes the need for transportation um, and that was designed with simplicity in mind. We surrounded ourselves with uh, best experts that you can find um, on all fronts, scientific, nuclear, business, uh, first with the advisory board, then with the team that we put together, and that's been really um, crucial. I, I have a lot of experience in startups and, and hiring on juniors is, is complicated. I think we've reached the milestones we have today in so little time because of the expertise that our team has. As a startup, we can um, innovate and do things that governments can't, um, as demonstrated by a joint demonstration. Uh, we're the first to bring true innovation uh, to this space, and companies are looking for that. That's why Vector decided to partner with us rather than build a little team of 20 people and do their own thing. Um, startups really bring innovation. And then as a public-private partnership, projects uh, see faster completion and reduce delays than governments own projects. Uh, we avoid the waste and cost governance associated with government contractors, and risks are fully um, appraised early on to de determine if a project is feasible. And that's it. So thank you, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Any questions for our speakers? Are there any advantages associated with the use of horizontal versus vertical boreholes? Like, do you share the same vertical part and drill sideways a bunch of times? No, so we drill a vertical, so that's the same, and then horizontal. And one of the advantages is that they don't stack, all the canisters don't stack one uh, above the other, so it is, more, it is safer. And all the canisters are placed in that horizontal part, they are not placed in the vertical. And, and I mean, I could just add, like, you know, just uh, from, from the geology standpoint. Um, uh, in, a, in a vertical borehole environment, um, you're going through geologic strata. It's going to be a little messy, but there are going to be layers in it, right? And in a, in a vertical borehole model, the model really was to go down into crystal basement and, and, and use crystal basement as, as the most fundamental repository. Um, with the deep isolation effort, we realize that if this is the best horizon, we can we can come in here and we can place all of the waste in this leg, in this, or this horizon. We can also choose this horizon. We can choose another horizon. Or if the deep horizon is the best, we can do it here. Another element is um, with deep isolation, I haven't drawn it quite properly. But <coughs> the idea is that we actually have a gentle upward curve to this, and that the repository layer is here. So any thermal loading that occurs from here that would cause fluid migration comes, you know, tends to push anything towards the dead end portion of, of the uh, repository. Whereas here, uh, you know, you're stacking the entire load and you're providing, you know, the thermal pulse is going to be directed vertically. So those are just a couple of differences. There's a bunch of others. Questions? How many canisters fill, um, are, are able to be stored in this, for example? So it depends on the length of the repository. So a typical repository might be uh, one to two kilometers long. Uh, and if a typical canister is about four meters, is the, let's see, uh, well, yes, well, yeah, on the order, you know, on the order of 100 to 200. So I mean, it's it's you will need multiple boreholes in order to uh, multiple boreholes bore bore to manage the waste inventory for um, a PWR reactor complex. It's not just going to be one. And on average, we're thinking maybe three boreholes. Alex, do you plan to control access to the site over the whole lifetime of the uh, yeah, the how? So you're, that's over like. Millions of years? No, millions of years, no. Well, that's I don't think we can, yeah, well, that's okay. Well, so, 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 so the title would go to a government. So they would oh, so they would, okay. Yeah, they would be 
uh, a, a lower corrosion resistant material in your canvas. Which, which alloy was mentioned in this paper? Was the alloy 22? 625. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's I'm sorry, that's, that's inaccurate, and I would have to check. I mean, I know that that's been modified several times, I see. and uh, that's still yeah, under consideration. And I'm not sure exactly where it stands now. In, in your development uh, so far, how far are you been considering accident scenarios, right? So it's nuclear, that's one of the first things that at some point you have to consider what happens when things go wrong. And uh, that's where always the challenge is. So did you, do you consider accidents? scenarios by putting things down uh, or, or for example not making it all the way down there getting stuck in between how far are you with this we, uh, we filed we filed a patent today so okay uh, <laughs> there's, a, there, there's a lot of effort that's going into that okay. and i'm not sure the status of all the patent application so mm -hmm. we'll take it in for mm -hmm. and it a lot similar vein um, so if the fuel underwent some sort of accident scenario and isn't in like a nicely formed fuel rod anymore. Is there ideas of isolating waste materials from nuclear accidents uh, that are like made? Absolutely. You just have to, you know, you can, that's almost, that you can just, you know, use the, 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 the same diameter canister and, and uh, you know, put in whatever type of waste it is. I mean, I mean of course, it's going to make, be, there's going to be some corrosion issues that you have to think about. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's absolutely something we've thought about. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm curious if you didn't any of those tests where you drop the canister and you retrieve them. Like if you tried filling one before you started retrieving them all again, or if they were all like a sort of like same day tests like that. So there were prototypes, they were simulating the weight uh, and so on, but we can't fill them with actual nuclear waste that we see. No, I didn't mean like with waste, but I just meant like. Yeah, so so, um, so there's there are a limited number of tests we've been able to do at this point financially. Um, it's expensive to, to do these operations, and so that's part of like, the next round of, of work that we're doing that we've got. But they were not like they were the same weight that a canister would have, so we didn't. Um, and, and there, you know, and there are all uh, you know a lot of ideas have been discussed about arresting the you know if a canister is released for for some, for any reason, so that it has a self arresting capability. Questions and uh, let's thank the speakers. Uh, we really hope that. Uh